Hi, this is Professor Stugard, and in this video we're going to talk about an introduction to creating models in the R programming language. So our goals for this lecture, first of all, uh, understanding the importance of partitioning our data, which is true whether we're using R or, or not, how we're able to then partition the data if we are using R, and then we want to talk about ways that our modeling can go wrong and what we want to be cognizant of when we build our different types of models. So first of all, why do we create models? Well, we're given this data. What we want to do is really understand what's going on with the data. Are there patterns in the data? Can we use the data to make predictions? And so our goal is to separate the signal from the noise. Now, when we say signal, the signal is the term we use for the patterns that truly do exist in the data. Um, and not just in our given data set, but hopefully uh, in the every similar data set that we could come up with. So again, we're, we have our small sample. We're hoping to find a pattern in that sample that can be applied to the population as a whole. The problem that we can run into is that, well, with the signal comes the noise. And noise is the term we use for patterns that appear in our data set, but are only examples of random chance and don't actually exist in similar data. So it exists in our small sample, but doesn't exist in the population as a whole. Um, and so, well, that can definitely be an issue if we say, hey, I found a pattern. But if it's noise, then it's not really a true pattern. So when we create our models from our data, again, which we're trying to use to make predictions, a way to ensure that we have discovered true patterns, which are our signals, and not just random chance patterns, our noise, is to split our data set into two groups. One of these groups is used to create our model. This is called our training group, to train our model then we have to preserve some of our data as our testing data. So once we create our model, then we use our testing data and say, okay, well, does the model actually work for the testing data too? All right, and so again, we need to set that aside. So we divide it, there's no overlap. And again, when we partition our data, the most important thing uh, is to preserve that testing data and set it aside. We cannot use it until the very, very end when we check the fit of our model. All right, so we use the training data as much as we want. We can use the training data to create a bunch of different models. That's fine. Um, and then see which model seems to be the best out of all the training data that we've used and, and uh, worked with for quite a while. And then at the end, when we think we have a good result or a good model, that is the only time we're allowed to use the testing data at the very end. And we can only use it once. Once you use that testing data once, that's it. Anything we did with our model, if it doesn't work with, on our testing data, basically has to be thrown out and we have to start over again because our testing data has been compromised. So when we partition the data, there's really two different methods. Um, like I said, the most common way is just to have a training set of data and a testing set of data. Um, which again, is a roughly, you wanna split it roughly 75, 25, or you could go 80, 20, um, but again, roughly around those ratios. Um, so again, you want the majority of your data to be the training data so that you have a robust training data set, and then a smaller subset for your testing data to test later on. Now, sometimes you want to create actually three partitions. You have your training data, you have your testing data, and then you set aside a third set of data as your query data. And, and this is used to kind of, as you're testing data before you actually test it, so that you can compare multiple models before that final test. Um, so again, those are the two methods that we typically use. Um, again, I would say the first one is probably more common. Um, we do the training and the testing, but there's absolutely times where you wanna set aside your query data as well, but again, the whole idea is you take your data set, you're splitting it, you're preserving most of it for training, some of it for, for testing, and there's no overlap, and that testing data cannot be used until the very, very end. Now, to be able to partition your data and split it up, um, luckily we have some very useful functions in R to do that, that all come from the tidy models package. Um, when we partition data, or we wanna create our bootstrap samples, we want it to be done randomly, but computers actually can't be completely random. They're programmed by man, they're ones and zeros. They can't actually truly be random. They can't come up with something just off the top of their head. So what we have to do is actually define a random seed for the computer to use. The random seed, again, the computer will act randomly, but there actually is some underlying 
algorithm that's creating the randomization for us. Now, one of the really cool parts about this is that when we set our random seed, the nice part is once we have that random seed set, it also makes our results more reproducible because someone else can pick the same random seed and hopefully their data gets split the same way so they get the same results that we do. And again, so you can kind of make consistent randomization. Now, the easiest way to do this is just the set.seed function. So again, this is a, a base R function, set.seed, and you pick a random number. So again, for example, 111. Doesn't matter what you pick, pick whatever your favorite number is. But again, just make sure it's consistent and make sure that you have it written down later on for your reproducibility, or you've preserved it in your R script or R markdown file um, for later on. Now, to partition the data, there's several functions. So the first is initial split. And again, that randomly splits the data. Once you set your random seed, it's going to randomly split the data um, into a single object that has the partitioned data. So again, it takes your data, it splits your data, but again, keeps it all as one single object in R. And then what you can do is call the training data with the training function or call the testing data with the testing function. Um, and again, by default, it is going to use method one where there's just the training data and the testing data. And by default, it's going to split at 75-25. You can adjust these ratios if you want, and you can create more um, partitions if you want as well. But again, those are the, the defaults for this particular function. So again, initial split splits it up, and the output is going to be uh, partition data altogether. And then you can pull the parts from the partition data. Now, for a classification model, we want to make sure that um, we define our prediction or our response variable as, a, as our strata, all right? So that way it identifies from the get-go what variable it is we want to try to predict with our model. So for example, if I'm given a data set called data, I'm going to put uh, my data set data into the initial split function. And then I want to define my argument strata to equal whichever variable it is I hope to predict. And then again, you want to store this in some new object. So again, like data split and be as descriptive as possible. Usually, again, I just include the underscore and then what I just did. So if my data was called data, then when I split it up, it's called data split. All right. Um, and so again, the, you want to make your first argument the data or you could pipe it in. And then again, you typically do want to define what the strata is going to be that you're trying to predict later on. Then from there, so again, like I said, I prefer to just put the underscore at the end. So my data, my training data will be data underscore train. And again, your data set might not be called data, but the underscore train part I think is nice. And again, you use the training function and it pulls from the data split and pulls just the training data and puts it into a data frame for you. And similarly, testing, if you run the testing function on your data split, um, again, it's going to re return just the data frame of just your testing data. So again, it separates that data for you. So now you have two separate data frames uh, from your initial data frame. You now split it into two separate ones using this set of functions. Now, if we need to create our bootstrap resamples, and again, typically this is if our data set is small, um, our bootstrap resamples have to come from our training data. And so we just use the bootstraps function. And again, I think it's best to be as descriptive as possible. You are going to create lots and lots of objects when you're doing this modeling. There's going to be tons of objects in your environment. Um, and so again, data underscore boot for my bootstrap samples. And again, it's just the function bootstraps. And again, you're running that on your training data. Now, when we test our models, um, well, like I said, we can only use we only use the training data to create it. When we tell technology to create models from the data, it's going to do that. Once we have the model, the question is whether we captured signal or just noise. So determine whether the model accurately describes the data, this is when we bring in our testing data. We, we do our final fit at the end and we can see, okay, does the testing data still get the same results as the training data? That's good evidence that our model worked correctly, uh, but it's not necessarily always a guarantee if our training data comes up with a good model that actually worked. And again, that's why we have our testing data. So it doesn't mean that our model is accurate. Again, it's just evidence. Then when we use our testing data. It really helps to well, supply us with more evidence whether or not our model works. And so when we create our models, 
we want two things. Number one is accurate. It's got to be an accurate model. If it's not accurate, there's no point. So we want an accurate pattern to describe our, or an accurate model to describe our patterns. And we also want it to be as simple. Um, we can make our models as complex as possible, but typically simple is better. Because what happens if we make our model too complex, if we make it too good at predicting based on my training data, what can happen is we can get an overfit model. All right. If our training data creates a model that perfectly matches it, well, then typically it's going to be overfit because it's only good for that set of training data. All right. And then the testing data would let us see that, okay, it's not really working. But again, the testing data can absolutely have this issue where it is overfit. So what does that mean? Well, a model is overfit when it fits that data too closely and then fails to predict future observations. So it'll fail during the testing phase. And again, overfitting really occurs when the model mistakes are random noise for a predictable signal. And the more complex a model is, the more prone it is to being overfit. So let's see what this would look like visually. So let's say I have this testing data and my testing data, clearly there seems to be a little bit of a pattern here. It's kind of U-shaped. There definitely seems to be a pattern. Well, if I tell my model, all right, create the best possible model that predicts exactly what's going on, it's gonna say, okay, connect all the dots. And here's this really complicated function that perfectly matches this data and I am 100% successful at predicting each one of these points because it's exactly on the line. But that's no good because if I put a second set of data over top, it's not gonna match at all. It's no good for my predictions, it's overfit. Now. The other side of that is being underfitting. When a model is not complex enough to accurately capture these relationships, um, it's underfit. And so visually, what this would kind of look like is, okay, let's just say that data set, eh, a line, close enough. And again, that's really not a good way to describe that data. That's not, is, that's not what's going on. It's not complex enough. So there's this sweet spot in the middle where we get our desired model that's in between being too complex and too overfit and being too simple and too underfit where we really want to stop there. And that's kind of a complex question and something we'll tackle way more if we talk more about machine learning um, later on. But it's something we wanna be cognizant of and, and careful to, to know that, well, it exists every time we create a model to describe our data. All right, so that wraps it up for this video. So can you answer the following questions? Uh, number one, why does our data have to be partitioned when we create our models? Number two, how do I partition my data in R? And third, what does it mean if a model is overfit? Make sure you can answer those three questions. If not, rewatch the video. And as always, take care of yourselves.